That's our intro. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. What is this, boys? Episode five? We're clipping along. Um, tonight, we want to talk about, because we got so many questions on our last podcast. Check it out. It was episode four on uh, strength training. But tonight, we want to talk about these handy-dandy fitness tractors, pros and cons, why we believe in them and certain things and why we don't. Um, and then we just want to talk about, honestly, all things fitness uh, outside of that, maybe a little bit of resistance training based. And then Cody will, of course, do his lightning round at the very end, which is always fun. So, gentlemen, how are we doing tonight? How was y'all's weekend? Was it good? Yeah, I had a fantastic weekend. Sounds awesome. Weekend. Joseph had a very eventful uh, night. Was it last night? For, well, it's probably a different podcast, not for this one. Not uh, this one. Cody probably, Cody's a mystery. We never know what Cody does. But he's here. Cody, do you have a new background tonight? I feel like it looks good. You have some trophies back there. My wife helped me get a uh, shelving unit and I've put it, this has been like four or five years in the making. Um, and so uh, it happened and I'm excited about it because I feel a little jealous with y'all's backgrounds. And uh, now that we're on a podcast, yeah. I feel like this was timely. So my office good, is man. a little bit more organized. It looks good. Probably a lot of books you haven't read and all that, but you're getting to it. You're getting to it. So guys, let's just kick it off because we got a lot of questions about this is like, why? Cause we kind of bash fitness tractor, fitness trackers last talk. And it was really kind of like, haha, in jest in fun, but let's dive into it on like why we trust them, why we don't trust them and how they're used in research and analyzing calorie output, energy output and all that. So like Joseph, give us a little broad explanation on like what they're able to do, not do. And let's just go from there, man. Uh, your, your fitness tracker, what they can do, they can tell time pretty well. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> they can uh, help get you updates from your phone really well. So you can set the settings. Uh, if you want to get <laughs> notifications about text messages or Facebook, um, they can do that really well as well. Um, and, you know, they can track distance, I think, fairly well. I would give them that. They can track distance pretty well, but mostly probably because you take your phone with you um, or it has a really uh, great way to learn your step count and it can track your distance that way as well. And I would say one of the things it doesn't do very well is monitor your calories. Um, it's very formula based. And so, again, the formula is very broad um, and we are not broad individuals. We are pretty individualized. And so it doesn't take much into consideration when guessing your calories. So a couple things does really good. One thing it doesn't do so good. Oh, do yeah, I got that. No, I, yeah, I got that question last podcast or there was a comment on there. It's like, well, then why do you wear it, Tyler? And I'm like, well, it tells time. It's my calendar. It's a messenger. It's a weather app. It's a compass. It's all these things. It plays music if I want it to. Um, I just don't care to really care about what it tells me. Um, during my workouts, because it's my workouts are very strength based and it's it's basically negligible on how accurate it is uh, during a strength training session. So it's very good at uh, measuring heart rate. It's very good at measuring distance. And that's about it. We were talking before this, boys, like, right. If you were to really how would Cody, how would you be like what devices, what things would you need on you during a workout to be as accurate as possible. What would you need? Probably a lot of things that would result in me having a really crummy workout. <laughs> <laughs> Very uncomfortable workout. Very uncomfortable. We were talking about the things like, like you got to have a mask on that measures uh, oxygen intake, you know, carbon dioxide exhaling. Um, and then we also talked about like, you would have to literally insert a, a needle into every basically muscle in your body to measure contractions, how hard the contractions were, how long the contractions lasted. You'd have to wear something around your chest that measures heart rate. You'd have to wear a mask. You'd have to measure something that went how far you went. You'd have to have something that measured how fast things went. You would look like a science experiment <laughs> during hey. every workout. Just now, go do, now go do burpees. <laughs> yeah, now go do burpees. Go sprint on a treadmill with all these things on you. And it just wouldn't be very accurate. Um, Joseph, what was that thing you were, you were saying that the word we couldn't, I mean, we had a little talk. Yeah, calamari. Yeah. Yeah. Was it calamari? <laughs> close. Yeah. Cody's close. Uh, Tyler, you're worse. Um, so <laughs> from, from a very nerdy, there's two pretty, one's really accurate. One is a little bit less accurate, but 
there's two ways to measure caloric expenditure. And one of them is direct calorimetry. And the mm. second one is indirect calorimetry. So direct, obviously the most accurate way you're in a vacuum and you're doing something, or maybe you're just surviving. And the room is measuring the heat expenditure. And there is a, there was a very accurate formula of how much heat you release. We correlate that to how many calories you are burning. Now that is a very expensive, very controlled way to go about things. So we don't do it very often. And the second way is indirect calorimetry, which some of you probably may be done, whether you've gotten like a BMR test done or an exercise uh, test where they tell you where you're burning fats and carbs. And we won't get into that. That's something completely nerdy. Um, and so, but indirect calorimetry is pretty much how much oxygen have you consumed and you know, utilized and how much oxygen have you exhaled? So I don't know if you know this, but air we breathe in is a very small percentage of oxygen. It's like 20% and don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere between like 18 and 22%. I think if I inhale two liters of oxygen, but I exhale one liter of oxygen, my net consumption was one liter of oxygen. Two minus one is one, right? For every one liter of oxygen that your body utilizes in that example, you burn five calories. That is indirect calorimetry at a whole. So literally it's, it's a respiration thing and a utilization tool that we use to figure out how many calories we are burning. It has absolutely nothing to do with your heart rate, which is why these might not be as accurate as we think they are because this measures solely your heart rate. Um, and so think of things, you know, a heart rate issue or, or a heart rate situation that probably doesn't burn that many calories is I would say like a panic attack. If I'm sitting here and my heart rate is just pounding through my chest, but I'm not doing anything, I'm probably not burning that many calories just because my heart rate is beating very, very fast. Now, if I'm like drenched in sweat, I'm shaking, I'm tremoring, I have all these muscle contractions going on, a little bit different story. But if my heart's just beating through my chest because I'm nervous, I might not be burning that many calories. One reason why, why we're bringing this up and why we're talking about it. It's like, why are we talking about fitness trackers and then being accurate, not accurate? Like why? Well, us being trainers, nutrition coaches, strength coaches, all those things. If we have a nutrition client or someone wanting to clean their nutrition up or someone to come, comes to us and saying, Hey, I'm burning 600 calories in my workout. A lot of our clients, a lot of the general public, general population is thinking because they burned 600 calories, their watch tells them that they can now refeed that. And so the reason why we talk about this a whole lot and why we don't believe in it is because if that is wrong, and you are burning 300 instead of 600 and you're refeeding in excess of 300 calories, well, now you're frustrated why there is no weight loss, why there is no movement on the scale, why there are no changes being made. And that's the main reason why we don't really care about them a whole lot. You know, especially if we have a strength client, like I got clients that like, we're just, we're working on the three power lifting movements. We're working on just getting strong. I could care less what that watch says like that. It tells me nothing. Like if I work on Cody, right. An RPE of eight, nine in a deadlifting session, we're working on a two, three, maybe five rep max. And we're spending 45 minutes deadlifting only resting two to five minutes in between sets that watch, right? Cody tells you nothing. It's impossible. So from like a strength training standpoint, Cody, what, how would you even talk about it? I mean, if really the goal is strength, I, I, I really wouldn't rely on the watch a whole lot to give us any feedback or any metrics that are really worth tracking, uh, broadly speaking, as it relates to like, are we getting stronger and whatnot? Because that's going to show up when you're on the bar or on paper with your training program, it can be, it can be challenging, like getting people to kind of separate all oh, my activity tracker, my fitness watch from um, a goal that just doesn't really utilize that as, as a meaningful source of information. So instead, if you're like, I want to get stronger, I want to increase lean body mass. Your, your watch isn't really going to give you a whole lot of information in terms of how effective your training is, if that makes sense. And we'll probably talk about this later. There are ways that we can use a watch in some capacity to help with those goals. You know, can we track sleep trends? Can we track, you know, daily step count trends? Um, you know, resting heart rate, you know, like, are you super, super strong, but you get out of breath when you tie your shoes and you're, you might die young. Like we can use a watch maybe in some of That's those me, by the capacities. Way. <laughs> Joseph's like, That's me. sign me up. <laughs> Like Cody, could could it aid? This kind of just popped in my head, and it could. I'm thinking about you know aid in 
rest time, recovering time, like what's your resting heart rate? Okay, it's 55, right? Like, would you even use it in just a just straight up strength training session around working around one to three rep maxes? RP is pretty high. You're working on sets of three and your heart rate goes to 160, 170. Like, would you care to look at the heart rate and like what it comes down to before you start your next set? Would that be something you care about? Good question. Um, m- Maybe. And it depends on a couple of things. If I have like a newer client and I just don't know them very well, or if maybe they don't know themselves very well, that the watch might be something that we lean on a little bit. And I, and, and I would ask, hey, are you recovering? How do you feel? And I'm looking at body language. I'm looking at how quickly or, or how fast they're breathing. Um, I'm looking at like exertion on their face and whatnot. Can they carry a conversation with me? And then I'll ask like, how do you feel recovered? And if they're like still wincing and like huffing and puffing and they're like, yeah, put me in coach. <laughs> like I might say, Hey, what, like, what's your heart rate on your heart rate monitor? And they're like, wow, it's still at 170. That might inform me saying, hey, maybe we should take another minute or two to rest so that we can maintain higher intensities where it matters, which is on the bar. With a more advanced athlete, I could probably say, hey, do you feel recovered? And they're going to give me a very accurate answer. They're going to be like, yeah, I feel good or no, I need more time. I don't really care about the watch um, just because they're just more in tune with like how they feel and, and what kind of rest they need. Joseph, over to you. Sorry. No, totally good. Cody could talk our ears off, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I know there's a couple of fitness models out there who will tell you what percentage you should be at of exertion, right? So, hey, we're at 60% today. We're at 80% today, 90% today. I think that if you understand there's something called the Carvonin formula of how to figure out that percentage of exertion. And if you know your ranges for that and you have your fitness tracker that can track your heart rate, you can really you can really crank up or crank down your intensity because sometimes when someone asks us to be at 70%, like, what does that really mean? And you could really use your watch as a tool to, to sit there. Cause sometimes we might go all out and we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why did my heart rate get so high? I actually need to shut down if I want to effectively complete this workout, or maybe I need to ramp it up a little bit if I need to effectively complete this workout as well. So playing around with those um, percents of, you know, intensities, it's called the Carvonin formula with a K you can, so you can just type in some information. All you need is uh, your resting heart rate and your age. Um, and it, it will do the calculations for you. But when, if you have a trainer who, or a, or a fitness program who tells you what percent you should be at, um, then you will, you will have that information, that data to help out as well. And one yeah. thing I'll add to that, Joseph, um, you bring up a really cool point and I have, there's two things I want to bring up one for listeners. They're probably familiar with like the, the 220 minus your age gives you like your max heart rate. And then you can take a percentage of that. If you're just out and about and you need a quick estimation, you can use that, but go do what Joseph just recommended. The Carvonin formula will give you a much more accurate representation of like where you should be training. And then Joseph, I have a question for you. This brings up, this brings up so many thoughts. Tell me like, tell me a little bit more about the fat burning zone. (laughs) Oh gosh. We were just talking about this. I was just telling Cody and Tyler, like, I feel like, so we at facts over fads, my nutrition company, we do weekly calls and we just talked about the fat burning zone. And I was showing like our calls versus like our podcast, like they're such in sync, like by accident. It's so funny. We just talked about this. So there's a couple of things we need to understand. Your body burns three main sources of energy, creatine, carbs, slash sugars, and fats. They are all going at the same time that not one ever starts or stops. And it's a bigger, like, so sometimes our fat burning percentage is a larger percentage than our carbs and our uh, creatine. Sometimes creatine is a larger percentage than our carbs and our fats. So I was telling all of our clients, if you want to burn more fat, more overall qualitative fat, quality fat, work harder, work harder. Like that's the example, work out at a higher intensity because You might be burning a smaller percentage, but that smaller percentage of an overall bigger number, it's still more than a larger percentage of a small number. And I forget the example uh, I gave the other day, but it's essentially like, what if we did, we're in like, we're burning 80% of fats, but we only burned 
a hundred calories total. So we burned about 80 calories from fat. But what if I burned, and I don't know if the math is going to check out, but what if I burned 50% fat, which is technically less percentage of a fat, but I burned 500 overall calories, right? And so I burned 250 calories from fat. 500 calorie example, I burned more fat, but I technically wasn't in a fat burning zone. And so that's kind of the difference of, hey, if we go walking on a treadmill, we're burning primarily fat, but at a really slow rate. And if we increase intensity, we're burning less overall percentage of fat, but we're burning more total calories from fat because I'm working out at a higher intensity. So a little confusing. Um, and so fat burning zone, don't care about it. I think people who really need to pay attention to a fat burning zone are like bodybuilders who are really trying to preserve muscle mass. Um, and that's about it. If you just are, have an overall weight loss goal, my answer is always work harder and be in an energy deficit <laughs> and, and, be eat, in a and eat appropriately, eat appropriately. <laughs> yeah. What is we, we've, we've thrown out the term a few times, RPE rate of perceived exertion. Um, tell the audience a little bit about that, Cody, like, how would you measure it? What is it? How do you find it? Cause it's always, I, I go back and forth. Like, should we train off of RPE a lot? And I, I find it funny when I see, you know, lifters or people that are working out, they're like, ah, oh, this, this lift or this workout was a 7.5 out of 10. And I'm like, you have no idea that it's, there's no way that you, you know that, right? Like there's no way. So I always live in like low, medium, high of exertion, like in my mind, like, am I, is this like really getting after it? Or am I like, is the gas pedal halfway down a little bit? That's kind of how I measure RP, but like, what is it, Cody? And how, like, why do we care about it? This could be an entire, this could be a, a series of episodes. I'll try to <laughs> nutshell it. Uh, RPE is rating of perceived exertion. And ultimately it started with the Borg scale, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And it's not right. like one through 10, it's like eight through 22, I think, or 21 or something. Um, and it's predominantly used for like more endurance, um, or like cardiovascular activities. We've like adapted it to resistance training, strength workouts and whatnot. And so on a scale from one to 10, like one through five is basically is like nothing like this is it's very low intensity. You can almost consider it like warm up sets. Um, and then as you start getting at like six and sevens, those are like your moderate intensities. That's probably what Tyler's talking about in terms of like that two on his. I actually really like that, Tyler. One, two, or three it keeps it really simple. And then, you know, your, your eights, nines, and then tens are like your really high intensity, if not maximal effort. Um, so that's like one slice of it. The other piece is you look at it a little bit differently and it's um, reps in reserve. And this is, and all of this really probably only applies to like more advanced trainees. Like if you're just getting into resistance training exercise, uh, if you're, if you just want to lose a little bit of weight and move better and feel better, like you can learn about this and it can be a cool tool in your toolbox, but you know, it's not required. I really like using reps in reserve with my clients because I'll, if, if on the last set, I'm like, Hey, I want you to do as many reps as you can and leave two in the tank. So that's basically like, that's a hard set. That's a really hard training set. Tyler, I bet you really like to spend a lot of time at a one RIR or a nine RPE when you're doing well, your I really rack don't. pulls and deadlifts. I really don't. I leave no. a lot left in the tank, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tyler because... has been crushing the rack pulls. The poor no. rack is like struggling. <laughs> I do love rack pulls. Well, I love rack pulls one of y'all because I'm getting old. I'm 35. I can't like pull them from the floor. Uh, risk reward just isn't quite there anymore. Come leave over it. to hex bar deadlifts. The yeah. water's warm. Hey, I, just, I just got a trap bar last week, boys in the gym in the bullpen behind me so we're going to be hanging out for the people pulls. listening those are the same thing hex bar and trap bar same yes, thing yes yes <laughs> so uh if you don't know what a trap bar or hex bar is it kind of puts you more in a, a nice anatomically uh, sound position than pulling from the floor um and then it's kind of like the same as, as as rack pulls so i'll be living there for a little while boys i think my days from the floor might be a little bit of, we might revisit it once a month just to kind of see but yeah i leave a lot in the tank a lot because if i get injured or, or pull something, tweak something. It just sets me so far back that I'm really trying to stay safe nowadays with my training more than anything. Tyler, you bring up, you bring up something interesting and, and this ties things back in. I feel like with the watches, we definitely know based on the research that it is very common and very easy for us humans, even us like nutrition pros underestimate our caloric intake. We know that that's, that's just a very common uh, thing that occurs. 
When it comes to training, tell me a little bit about how accurate we gauge our training intensity. Tyler, you said I leave a lot in the tank. Do other people do that? When you're experiencing, when you're seeing other people train and they're like, oh, oh, 500 calories on my watch, crushed it today. Are, do you feel like they are accurately gauging their training intensity or how hard they are, are training? What do you guys think about that? Take well, I, that where you want. I think there's some people, they won't leave the gym or leave their workout until they meet this certain number on their watch, which is kind of weird because their, their workouts may look a little bit different. And then, you know, if, if you look at um, reps in reserve or RPE, that changes day to day. It, it, and that's why I truly um, find it silly to go by that because what if you just got over a cold? Well, if you're basing your RPE off of this number that you set a month ago, what's well, vastly different from when I'm over this cold in five days? So always going in there and working off of that number is weird. And then my reps in reserve are going to be different where if I'm not feeling well, I didn't sleep well super stressed out. So I always like to use like IR, R, R, RPE, like, right? Like how am I feeling that day in time? Did I eat well? Did I sleep well? Our schedules are all over, all over the place. Normally I work out around lunchtime. Sometimes I don't work out till five. That's a vastly different workout from a workout to lunch. So I take it from a day-to-day -day basis on how I'm feeling. And if I'm feeling it that day, like I, we might've touched on it a couple of podcasts ago, but like we have 10 workouts, right? There might be two where it's like crushed it, nailed it. I feel like Superman. And then the other eight or like glad I showed up today. But the, the important part is, is that I showed up that day and that I worked out and I, I did that. But I will say, I'll kick it to you here and Joseph, like I've been probably leaving more in the tank than I ever have in my entire life of training, maybe like, you know, 15 years of consistently training. And I am the strongest I've ever been. And my workouts are kind of mediocre, to be honest with you. I'm going in there. How do I feel that day? I'm leaving, um, feeling pretty good. I'm trying not to injure anything. I'm being pretty systematic. I'm not working around percentages and numbers and RPEs. It's just based on how am I feeling? Let's stay safe. Let's leave a little bit in the tank. Probably leaving a lot more than I used to, but it's literally the strongest I've ever been, which is kind of cool. Kind of neat. Not having to work near as hard, Cody. <laughs> I wonder, so before I dive into my journey over here, I wonder if that plays a role like why do you, why are you stronger today but you're working out quote unquote less harder does that have to be with like i bet your technique and your form is beautiful every rep because you're not struggling and getting sloppy in those last couple reps and also i think mentally you just feel more confident in the lifts and since you're not so exhausted at the end of every workout i wonder if you're actually working out more frequently as well mm -hmm. and so i think, I think a couple things that could play a role we mentioned this last podcast, right? Like you learning how to ride a bike is not getting stronger. It's learning. So I've now had 15 years of learning these movements. So when I'm fixing something, we're talking, it's like minute, minute details on how I'm setting up for that lift is my grip in this area. So it's little things that I'm fixing and little things that I'm making better when 15 years ago, the changes that I were making were giant. So then I think it's one, I know how to eat better. It's my years in the seat, which is, you know, 15 years. And then it's just the little tweaks that I'm making, just being smarter with those things. And I think I'm just starting to get into that, like um, old man strength, you know, how your grandpa was real strong when he gets older. I think I'm getting into that old man strength. The things are just like dense now. And they're not 25 year old muscles, which helps a lot. <laughs> well, we, uh, funny little sidebar is um, they've directly correlated overall body strength with grip strength. So if you're doing a lot more rack pulls, I bet your grip strength is getting a lot better. Even if we use wrist wraps or whatever the case may be, but for those first couple of light sets that you're probably doing, you're probably not right. And so I bet your grip is getting stronger. Um, and so that does play a huge role with everything else you do, whether you're gripping the bar for bench press or lat pull downs or pull-ups, like your grip plays a role in all of it. Um, so I bet that plays a role as well. Grip That's strength and all, all cause mortality. You're going to live a long time. Yeah. I need a, we used to have at the physical therapy place I used to work at, uh, we had God, the, the name escapes me, but it's a device. You squeeze it it measures output like digitally and all this. What is it called? Um, that one is downstairs. Um, it's, it's blowing my mind. You used to, I knew, I know there were certain metrics for certain chiropractic places and, and, uh, massage therapy and physical therapy places that you had to have a certain grip strength in your, um, basically interview process, application process for you to make it to the next parts. Is it a grip dyna dynamometer? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Dynamometer. I can't yeah. say cal 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 cal
and dinosaur trees and dinos <laughs> calamari and dinosaurs calamari um, and dinosaurs <laughs> That's what so we're talking about. bringing it back to fitness trackers, <laughs> I would love for everyone to do a little experiment for me. And, and again, the ways that um, a Fitbit versus an Apple watch versus a galaxy watch versus uh, whatever else is a Garmin, the way that they monitor your calories are all different, right? They, which makes they've trademarked their product for a reason. And so, but I know for Samsung galaxy watch is the only one I've ever had. Um, and so I'm going to talk about this one. If I pick like a strength training workout, when I, when I start my workout tracker, I could be laying down texting. And at 30 minutes, it tells me I burned 300 calories at 30 minutes. It just, it's a formula. And so I challenge you to do one of two things, start your fitness tracker and not do fitness and see how many extra calories it says you burned or change the mode of workout. So like, even if you're in the gym, turn it on running and see it and see what your calorie expenditure is. Is it the same? Is it different? Is it more? Is it less? Um, and just kind of see how, again, it's formula based. It's obviously like honesty. Am I really strength training or am I really running? But just to see like that wide range of caloric expenditure. And if you're really using that as a gauge for your nutrition, which is what a lot of people do, or you're using it as a gauge of how hard did I work? Like it's, that's not, it's not good at that. <laughs> and so don't use it. Like use your RPE, use your RIR, do those instead. Use your respiration rate is huge. Like if you're having a conversation mid workout, you're probably not working that hard, <laughs> you know, like mid lift or whatever. And so use all of that more so as a gauge than your tracker, which is formula it's all it is it's two plus two do y'all every time do you remember the nike fuel bands it was the first calorie output like measure of fitness ever right and it's just they're just running algorithms with accelerometers in them they're telling you how fast things are moving and i remember being in competition with people um <laughs> i'm gonna out myself but i could literally like we're really close or like say it wanted to like it had these like cool light up things. It would like tell you you're so close to whatever. And I'd be like on my couch, like at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm tired, but my fuel band hasn't closed. So I'd put it on my finger and I would go, and I would just spin it <laughs> for like a minute or two while I'm watching TV. And all of a sudden it would go, congratulations. And I'm like, this thing's there. Okay. I just spun it around my finger a bunch of times, but that's what it's doing. It's just measuring speed in movement and if you're trying to base things off of speed and movement all the time you can just twirl your finger around apparently and i'll burn a thousand calories <laughs> i thought you were gonna say that you strapped it onto your dog and <laughs> i thought that was what i thought was coming here. i know there's been some people in some fitness competitions like corporate fitness competitions that have done that they're like put it on their dogs and like go play fetch with them and like wow you really like running this spot to there back and forth <laughs> a lot <laughs> Well, so something that is interesting in this, we, we'll probably talk about this in a future episode. There are a lot of um, either businesses, but like insurance companies that you can get like a credit if with your activity tracker, you get a certain number of steps per day, right? Um, and so what this makes me think is like these insurance companies, we won't dive into like insurance, like health insurance companies. But what I will say is like, they need to be quote unquote financially savvy. And if they're putting like a quote unquote bounty on you going and getting steps in, they're willing to like give you like a 30, 50, $60 credit per month. If you get enough steps in that shines a light on how important intentional movement is. Right. So like what a cool way to to incentivize people to just go get their steps. I, I don't know. I think that's super fascinating. I think it's super cool. Uh, if you're not getting enough steps in, this is your well, sign to, to go. Yeah, Cody, we, we talked about, we had a little conversation before we started and it was like, okay, like the pros behind this is like, look, we're, we're sitting here talking about things that it, it can't do, but you know, if we're really boiling it down to, okay, is it burning 400 or 600? Is it telling you, you ran a mile or 1.1 miles? Is it saying your heart rate is 60 instead of 62? Like the fact of the matter is, is if you're arguing over the amount of calories that actually burn and you're not, it, it's a positive thing because it means you're moving. It means you're working out. It means you're being healthy. It means you're being, you know, intentional with being healthy and work and that you care about those things. So those are all positives. I get into it all the time with some of my clients and I'm like, look, the fact that I'm, that, that we're talking about this right now is a super positive thing. Like it, we're, we're kind of talking uh, the devil's in the details. That's cool. But let's just look at the overall picture of you moving and you caring about this is nothing but good stuff. So if you're wearing one of these bad boys and you're caring about how many calories are coming out of it and you're caring about how much you're moving and you're caring about the distance you travel and you're caring about your heart rate, like only good things are going to come out of that. It's when you try and start being really specific with that, that it could kind of get you in trouble, but 
overall, man, like all positive stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, we, t- we talked about that before we started. And if you guys are curious on, on how much thought we put into these, we put about four minutes before we start recording <laughs> on, on, oh, sorry, sorry. By I'm four, really he meant 4D, 4D. Oh, 4D. 40 minutes. Um, and so, but we did talk about like the, the accountability piece. Like if it is driving home some accountability for you to start your fitness tracker, bring your fitness tracker, like charge your fitness tracker, like get ready for tomorrow with your fitness tracker. Beautiful. Do not stop. Like if it is adding positive benefits to your life, great. But if you look at your fitness watch and it like almost makes you judge yourself, mm. then let's maybe not use it for that, you know? And so I know a, like in the boot camp world, people are like, don't start the workout yet. Cause I've got to start my watch. And I'm like, like, cool. Like if that's a piece of an account, like I'll give you 30 seconds to start your watch. Like no big, like I love that. But if you're going to sit here and tell me like my watch said, I burned a thousand calories. So I deserve Chick-fil-A or McDonald's. That's not, that's not good. Or if you're like, Oh, I really suck today because it only said I burned. 200 calories. That's not good either. You know? Yeah. Or if you're in an accountability competition with some friends, you know, I follow some of my clients through the Apple activity thing. And it tells me like that they did their workout for the day and that they moved and that they traveled. And I use that with some of my clients just as an accountability thing. I'll be like, look, I haven't seen you move in five days and you usually always move. So like, what's going on? Like, oh, either I haven't turned it on or I've been busy or whatever. So from an accountability standpoint, fantastic right like kudos to you if it's an accountability thing and all that so we don't want to poo-poo on it the whole time there's a lot of a lot of positives that come out of it right boys so since we're on the subjects let's let's round robin for listeners yeah tyler you go first how do you like like bullet point it for for folks listening how do you want them to use their activity tracker how do you not want them to use their activity tracker let's put it in cliff notes for folks yeah if you're a strength trainer meaning like you're going to the gym and you're just lifting weights i would like to know like how long are your workouts what is your heart rate getting to what's it getting down to for like recovery time roughly calorie expenditure just because it tells me maybe how hard you were we're not working out and i mean that from a did you go in there for an hour and it's telling me you burned 100 calories or did you go in there for an hour and it's telling me you burned a thousand i'm taking that as me being your trainer on like maybe how hard that session was in your perceived exertion in that session i can kind of get some readings from that if you're a cardio boot camp group class person it's like okay how long was your workout how far did you travel what was your heart rate ballpark calories tells me maybe how hard that workout was or was not for you. Um, and that's, that's really all I care about in those areas. You know, me being your trainer and looking at it. Yeah. I would, I would say, um, I would say unless you're using it for an accountability piece, I just, I don't care if it's, I really don't, I'm sorry. I will never, I will tell you this. I've been a personal trainer for 10 years, meaning I've had at least one client every day of the week for the last 10 years. I have never taken someone's watch data and made a different decision in my program for you ever, ever in a million years. I'll never do it. I will, I will have a conversation with you and I will let your conversation make changes to my program for you, but I will not take your watch data. And so again, my big thing is no. Um, but if it's, if it's like the reason you like going to work out so you can see all of your trends and you can start it and you can, you're challenging other people and it's an accountability piece. Yes. Like go do it, like obsess over that. Great. Um, but I'm not going to make changes to your program or your nutrition based off of your watch data. You brought up an interesting point, um, whether or not the information changes your decision-making. And I think very broadly speaking, your watch probably isn't going to tell you something you don't already know. Right. And so like, if you're like, "Uh, I think I need my watch to track my steps. Are you moving enough? You probably know that you are, or you are not like, are you training actually hard? Again, this goes back. Like we probably don't have a good read on that, but again, like your watch isn't really going to be a great measure of that anyways. Right. Joseph, you brought up trends. I like trends. Like if you want to track what you're like, if, if you're working with a coach and you're implementing some stuff, can we look at some of your data from three months ago? And is the trend improving? Like, are you getting into bed more consistently? Are you getting just more hours? Great. We know that these things have a huge margin of error. Twenty. 30%. So it says you burned 500 calories. That might be 650. That might be 350, right? So that margin of Good error. Math. Like, that was like quick math, Cody. I'm proud of you for that. 
I, I spent all day doing it. And I have I'm getting my TI 83 out right now, real quick, boys. Let me check that real quick. <laughs> this is my um, TI 83 from college, by the way. Keep going. I am. I, I think Joseph brought up the best point is like is trends. Um, and that's probably if you if you do want to focus on the data and the metrics, make sure that your trends are improving. And that's like, is your resting heart rate improving? Is it getting lower? Is your average step count where it needs to be or improving? A lot of the interfaces that some of these watches have, like on the computer and whatnot, like look at the calendar. Are you actually working out three to four or five times a week, right? Like I don't turn mine on when I work out, but if you are somebody who does turn your watch on, it'll let you know how consistent you are, right? And so those are the trends that we can like definitely follow, but slippery slope because, and Tyler, you already kind of alluded to it. When you're looking at your watch and you're like, this was a great workout. I burned 500 calories. Caloric expenditure during the workout does not necessarily mean that it was a good or an effective workout for your goals. And then the other thing is it's a slippery slope with like a poor relationship with food. If you then go use that, I burned 500 calories and I earned or I deserve, or I have to go re-eat those calories. So I deserved the donut. That's a that's a slippery slope that I would caution a lot of folks away from. You can honestly you can hear some of that like narrative the day after Thanksgiving, the day after a yeah. birthday. Oh, I had a great Thanksgiving. I need to go burn off all of that food. Uh, <laughs> that is, might deserve a little bit of like you could support. look. You could probably do this from a tracking standpoint in a graph. Graph, how many days a week you've worked out. Graph, I bet they're directly proportional to each other. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> That's really it. Like, just graph that. Don't even take into account what you did, how you did it, and how it felt. Just graph how consistent you were, and that is going to be directly proportional with your lack thereof results or results. So that's the two graphs I would look at. And I think we need to like the three of us live and breathe in the fitness and nutrition world every day. So, you know, when Cody says, I don't have to start my fitness watch, I know myself when Miller says, Hey, I'm leaving a lot left in the tank. We've been doing this for so long and we've been working out every day for the last 15 years or almost every day. And so if you don't live and breathe in the nutrition and fitness world, a uh, tracker can help you kind of learn more about yourself. The tracker is helping you with that. You're way better off. So learn as much as you can and don't let us say you don't need it or you do need it. Dictate that. Just take it for what it is. If it's benefiting you, great. And if you're like, man, I don't really care too much about it, then you probably don't need it, except it looks cool. I've got a white band on this side and a blue band on the other side because America. <laughs> hey, you fancy. <laughs> oh, man. Let's land the plane on that fitness tracker. Cody, we're going to lightning now, boys. It's time. All right, Woo! it's time. It's time. Um, Let me put my TI-83 away and get out my <laughs> stopwatch. Oh, 30 man. seconds, boys. 30 seconds, Joe. Joseph, let's not have a repeat of last time, please. <laughs> okay. Hey, I just want to let everyone know I answered a question in 0.4 seconds, and apparently that was too fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have, is it three questions, Cody? Is that what you got for us? How many do you have? You know, I think we did three last time. Can we, okay. let's be greedy. Let's do four this time. Let's, do, let's do four. You, let's you do kick four. it off, man. The show is yours now. Hey, if you're a first time listener, this is the lightning round, the, the, the Twitter tweeter round, the succinct cliff note round. I will be asking Tyler and Joseph a question. And this is a question that comes up from our clients or that we've just answered maybe a million times uh, over the last however many years or decades. They have 30 seconds to answer the question or provide clarity, however you want to look at it. Uh, since Joseph did answer the first question last time in 0 0.09 <laughs> nanoseconds, I'm going to start with Tyler today. Okay. But Joseph, I'll, you'll I'll have set the precedent. 30 seconds you, is going to be a tricky go one. Watch, go watch episode four. It was fantastic. A, <laughs> go watch episode four. Okay, Twitter round, lightning round. Here we go. First question. Tyler, you are up 30 seconds on the clock. Okay. How much water should I drink per day or how do I determine how much water I should drink per day? Three, two, one, go. Yeah, we're just going to call it somewhere between 100 and 120 ounces. All right, I usually tell females around 100 ounces. I usually tell males around 120 ounces. Um, that can all vary on time of year, intensity of workout. Obviously, obviously, if it's hot, you're going to sweat a lot more. So you might end up around 120, 140. If it's a cold time of the year, workouts aren't as intense. You might end up around 100. So for sake of just simplicity, 
Let's say 100 to 120. That's where I'm going to land. Two seconds to spare. That was good. Two seconds to spare. (laughs) Joseph, uh, how much water do I drink per day? Or how do I determine how much water to drink per day? Three, two, one, go. Drink more water. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just kidding. So I'm going to piggyback off of Tyler's answer. 100 to 120 ounces, a fantastic range. Males, uh, males a little bit higher, females a little bit lower. If you are concerned about drinking too much, the thing you're concerned about is something called hyponitremia. If that is the case and you live in America, that's not a problem because everything is salted in America. So you will never become hyponitremic. So drink more water. Three, two, and time. Nailed it. I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback on this one really quickly. I'm going to time myself too. I'm on the clock, a weird recommendation for anybody else out there, maybe setting aside diabetics, five pretty clear urinations per day. That's one of my favorite recommendations. It automatically takes into account the water content of your food, ambient temperature, how much you sweat, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So five clear urinations per day is a pretty good. I need, good to, I need to put a little, like a, like a whiteboard or a chalkboard by my by my restroom number two number three number four i'm one away cody said i'm good to go count it (laughs) okay next question uh tyler this is a great one Uh oh does cla also known as conjugated linoleic acid help with fat loss three two one go only thing that helps with fat loss is being in a caloric deficit working out being consistent getting sleep drinking water and that's it. There's no magic CLA, whatever Cody just said. No, there's not. It does not help. It never will. Show me a study that does. I'm out. <laughs> study in humans too, by the way. Yeah, in humans, not salamanders. Fine, that was a good one. Joseph, I feel like this is going to be a challenging one for you. You're going to have to speak quickly and concisely. Joseph, does conjugated linoleic acid help with my fat loss? Three, two, one. Go. Conjugated linoleic acid, CLA, helps the body utilize fat for energy. However, if you are not in a caloric deficit nutritionally or through exercise or whatever the case may be, you can burn all the fat you want, but you are still storing more fat than you're burning. So you're burning fat, great. CLA helped you, but you're still eating like crap, training like crap, and so you're still fat. Gosh, you guys are great. Two to three seconds. So it sounds like if we, if we, if conjugated linoleic acid is the first thing that we try to do on our fat loss journey, it's it's a lot like stepping over a hundred dollar bill to pick up a penny. Yeah. Bam. Huge. Okay. This is good. That was I'm a good so analogy. Much. Both Tyler had a good analogy earlier, and that was a, you stepped over a hundred dollar bill, which is nutrition, training, water, sleep to pick up a penny, which is CLA, some other form of fat burner. That was fantastic. Raspberry ketones. And then you're like, I have have 10 cents. I have 10 cents. I'm so rich. And you're like, you just stepped over $500. (laughs) Okay. Podcast number six, raspberry ketones. No. Question three. Back to you, Joseph. Two in a row, buddy. Can collagen as a supplement count towards my daily protein intake? Is it going to help me get lean body mass? Three, two, one, go. No. Collagen is a very poor protein in terms of muscle building due to its amino acid uh, makeup, right? And so, you know, chicken breast, egg whites, whey have a very much more anabolic amino acid profile, whereas collagen does not. Collagen can and has been proven to help you with hair, nails, skin, everything except muscle mass. So if you have a collagen supplement, do not add that into your protein requirement for the day. It's just extra. Time, right on the money. Tyler, can collagen protein count towards my daily protein? Will it help me build muscle? Three, two, one, go. Yeah, to just expand on what Joseph said, 100% right. Um, The biograde availability of collagen is pretty poor, meaning we don't uptake it very well. There's, we talked about this in the nutrition podcast, but there's essential and non-essential amino acids. It's missing a bunch. So it's a sim- simply a, a incomplete protein. So relying on that as your sole protein source uh, is pretty poor. Um, that's all I got. But what if it's collagen? CLA and caffeine <laughs> all in one product. You have three cents in a current, like in a Zimbabwean currency that's like 10,000% inflated. <laughs> Almost ne- there. Next America. podcast is financial fitness. Oh, Ooh. 
nice. I do like it. There are a lot of analogies between finances and nutrition and fitness, man. Mm. Uh, Tyler, you are up. Good, sir. Question number four on the lightning round. Caffeine and more specifically caffeine consumed in the form of our favorite beverage, Arabian wine. Black gold, the nectar of the gods. <laughs> Arabian coffee. coffee. Is coffee bad yeah. for me? Can I drink coffee? Three, two, no. one, go. Coffee has been shown to increase performance, uh, increase the, I guess, the workouts are enhanced. Um, it is not a diuretic. It's most uh, always the stuff that's going in your coffee is why we stay away from coffee because it usually turns into a dessert. Coffee inherently by itself uh, is not bad at all. Have all you want. Um, 3,500 milligrams per day. But yeah, it's good for you. Drink it. Have it. Love it. Wait, wait. Time. wait. Did you just say 3.5 grams of caffeine per day? No, 3,500. 30, <laughs> no, no, correct. No, no. 300, 350. 350. Not 350. 350. 350 milligrams. I was day. off on the numbers of sodium. Which is did y'all did y'all hear about the 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 supplement lab? It was like a university lab where they they like they like messed up a, a decimal point and they they gave their test subjects or it was like the researchers who were taking it. They took something like thirty thousand milligrams of caffeine. They had to go to the hospital. <laughs> no, did yeah. you? There's if you Google, it just happened recently. A guy was making his own pre workout and got the serving size of caffeine. He bought raw caffeine. And, and the container he bought didn't come with like a, with like a scoop. So he used his own and he did the, whatever serving size, uh, and quantity, he did the math wrong and he overdosed and killed himself on caffeine. And it was like, it was like he, instead of like, so 300, 300 milligrams of caffeine per day, I think is the safe. We want to try to stay below that. He took in like 10 thousand milligrams because it was supposed to be like a teaspoon and he used like a quarter of a cup it was wild he used like a protein scooper didn't he <laughs> <laughs> his heart was like a hummingbird it was yeah moving it just i forget he, and he was like a fitness influencer guy too um, he, he was trying to make his own pre-workout and he killed himself joseph <laughs> caffeine and more specifically in our favorite beverage arabian wine black gold the nectar of the gods coffee is coffee bad for us is caffeinated coffee bad for us can i drink coffee three two one go no caffeine is not bad for you i drink uh, at least one of these bad boys a day caffeine is an ergogenic aid i think that's the word i'm looking for it um is. and so it's an exercise enhancement right and so it helps turn on your nervous system it acts much like epinephrine and norepinephrine which is a hormones that are naturally released during exercise your fight or flight and so it can help mimic some of that so it helps with exercise however like tyler said we turn our coffee the whatever cody said the gods uh we turn it into a dessert and that's where it gets bad also caffeine does not give you energy it is simply a stimulant a neurotransmitter so quit thinking it gives you energy because it there's no calorie yeah. it technically takes away energy C coffee and, and really we're talking about like caffeine here as the like underlying thing caffeine can be great um i think the what's what's the ergogenic effective dose for athletes is three to don't quote me three to nine milligrams per kilogram of body weight um sounds about which, right like that range. nine can be a lot right um so, but that's generally the ergogenic dosage with that said i'm sure y'all have a lot of clients that they have a little bit of coffee and they're like oh anxiety jitters and whatnot if you don't tolerate caffeine or coffee you don't have to drink it or just you don't you don't have to but if you like it it's it's dandy just be like tyler said be careful about the, awesome. the sugar the creams don't put butter in your coffee shame yeah, on yeah that's a whole nother episode in itself also um with caffeine just like alcohol just like drugs like we will build up a tolerance so make sure that you kind of are on cycle of caffeine and then you take a break from caffeine and then you get back on it or or to tyler's point earlier like out of the 10 workouts if we're gonna have like two good ones or you know maybe we use caffeine on the days where we're feeling really good we know Know we're going to have a great workout, but the days where we already know it's going to be like so so, maybe we don't waste caffeine on that because it's, I don't think that caffeine is going to turn a so so day. Like if you're exhausted, stressed, anxious because of work, I don't think caffeine is going to take your workout to the next level. So maybe we use it um, as a tool, not as an everyday occurrence with our pre workouts or our coffee supplements before we work out. Is that it? Is that all we got? It was I feel like we opened up Pandora's box to, to caffeine and butter in your coffee. We'll talk about that maybe yeah. next time in financial fitness because we could talk a lot about that. So a little bit of foreshadowing to next podcast. Episode six will come out. It'll be financial fitness. We got to do it now, boys. So 
yeah uh gentlemen it was good to see y'all i'll see you next time y'all have a good evening y'all have a good evening audience and uh we'll see y'all later thanks for coming to the fit chat peace out